Hey guys, what's up, Aru? New special program. Let's see what new stuff we get. I love it already. In this video, we'll talk about everything in the latest special program as well as some speculations as to what 3.6 might have. Timestamps in the comments and description. Let's go. We now have a new Dragon Lord of Dendro named Apep or Apep. I'm 99.9% .9 sure that the hole on the northern side of the dunes is the entrance that leads to Apep's domain. Aptly named Apep's Resort, it's where the Wee Nut, Flying Serpents, as well as Apep itself built their courts. In a time unknown, Flying Serpents and Wee Nuts used to serve as court officials and flying companions. Yet today, they're but a shadow of their former selves. And Apep, the god of verdure or fresh vegetative colors, is now a pale shade of what she once was. Relying on what seems like a slow corrupting catalyst similar to what we see in the Aranyaka quests surrounded by parasites that taint it, likely a form of withering similar to the ones we see in the forest. And the same can be said for the domains of the once lush green dragon Apep, who is now the same shade as the yellow sand which represents weathering and erosion of rocks and wood, signifying the death of life. Something interesting is the Egyptian god Apep, which represents the serpent god of chaos and the enemy of light and order, as well as the possible serpent that is depicted on the sacred seals found in the desert. Apep fought with Ra, the solar deity, and the polder of light and order. The results of both the dragon lords as well as the battle of Apep and Ra are pretty similar. Apep was once a ruler of the older dynasty, and once Ra came introducing the new kingdom, Apep was defeated and trapped under the mortal realm, similar to what happens with the dragon lords and bishops after the first heavenly war. Another interesting thing about Apep is the similarity with Hallucigenia a creature of which existed in a time more than 5 million years ago. It was one of the creatures that were found in the so-called Cambrian Explosion, where evolution of complex life forms was at its peak, a time where life and biological creatures started to evolve from microscopic amoeba, the origin of great evolution, so to speak, and possibly what many forms of life came from. Apep's DNA-like attacks could be because Apep is the dragon of dendro and life, symbolizing the origin of all dragons. Possibly. Let's move on to where the mainspring of the abyss creatures spawn from. I wouldn't be surprised to see another chasm-like region underneath. The Forbidden Realm is guarded by a long-lost Darshan and mythical creatures, quote-unquote. Considering that this location is riddled with the abyss, maybe Sumeru scholars used to study the abyss, creating a long-lost Darshan that today would be forbidden because of the cataclysm. It doesn't help that the special program lined up the Iniquitous Baptist, the Forbidden Realm, and the rogue Hillichurls in such an order, making me think that these three are all sitting in one abyss-heavy area. The Hillichurl rogues use elemental powers similar to the Abyss Mages and Summatrils as well as the Lectors and Heralds, all of which chant before or while commencing an attack. We'll likely know more about both Kanria and the origins of the Abyss and maybe, theoretically, how the Abyss was studied as well. Another possible Darshan is Cryptozoology, the study of mythical creatures, which is found in the Forbidden Realm. The Amorta Darshan studies life in general but not specific to mythical life, something like the Yaksha or maybe Yokai as well as as gods, since the principles of normal beings wouldn't really apply to mythical creatures. Think of the hydrological studies of bishops in Enkonomiya, but it's in Sumeru. Lastly, the possibility of another nail inside of the Forbidden Realm. But since it wasn't shown in the program, a divine nail being there is very unlikely. Maybe a story about the nail, but no actual nail. Pari and Sarush is a reference to the Persian mythical creatures called Peri, exquisite winged spirits renowned for their beauty and their benevolence, compared to the scheming and deceitful divs and jinn. Pari are said to be beings that have been barred from entry to paradise until they complete their penance for atonement. Now where have we seen a story of beautiful beings being cast down from the divines? That's right, Seelies. Seelies were once beautiful and wise beings that lived in palaces outside of our realm. It's possible that these Pari are the beings whose ancestry come from the bygone race of godlike beings before becoming the guiding spirits known as Seelies. Since we haven't yet met a Seelie that retains some of their wisdom and could still speak, Sorush could very well be the few who were able to avoid its fate. It's not outlandish as well since we know of at least one who survived the fall of the Seelie race, implied as the goddess of flowers. So maybe there could be more survivors out there. Anyone looking to convert themselves into the Abyss Order? Well, now's the best chance of proving yourselves. Honestly, I'm thinking that something this crazy can only be an entity of the Abyss. Not the Abyss Order, the Abyss. 
Remember Skirk? Yeah, this could be one of the things that she beats up on a daily basis. I'm only inferring this because of the Fortune Lecter, a being from the Abyss that the Traveler mentions as not part of the Abyss Order. The Iniquitous Baptist reminds me of a similar case like Child, having two elements as well as the power of the Abyss. The galaxy-like style of its attacks are somewhat similar to the Fortune Lecter's cryo attacks as well. The shades of icy blue and the stars are present in both the Baptist and the Fortune Lecter's attacks. So maybe this is another being that knows of and guards the sinner. This brings up a question that I've always asked myself. That is, what else is in the Abyss? Is there a race that solely belongs to the Abyss? If so, where in the Abyss do they live and do they have a god? Or, you know, it's just a new lector from the Abyss Order. That's it. I wanted to discuss the voices last because of how Hoyo baits different voice lines with different cutscenes. Both voices we can assume are either as old as Conria or older. The first voice speaking of the Apocalypse could be the Baptist, because the only group right now who speaks of the Apocalypse that became the Apocalypse is the Abyss Order, therefore Conria, whose once great alchemist of their lost kingdom, Gold, unleashed Abyss monsters, and whose founder of their new order, Clotar, wanted to use the Abyss. Or maybe it's from someone from the first civilization that fell to temptation, and Kanomiya. One thing is for sure, they were victims of the apocalypse, but soon became the apocalypse itself. The dragon lords being destroyed by the primordial one neither became primordial ones, nor did they ascend to Celestia after the war. They became servants and maybe friends of the Archons, which are implied to be lesser gods. It's possible we get to speak with this voice in one of those computers in the first scene as well, making the first time we speak with another person from Conria or somewhere else through these devices. The dragons we've met so far all have broad and deity-like echoey voices compared to the robotic first voice. Even the Oceanid sounds this way, which leads us to the next voice, a god-like echoey voice similar to many of the dragons we met in Tavat. What the second voice says fits what the dragon lords stand for as well, existing for a fraction of of what humans know as time and calling archons lords by leaning on the heaven's glow. The heaven's glow to me is the light realm, which is the elemental realm where all elemental beings come from, including Apep and all the dragon lords. The only beings that can live for longer than a fraction of time are none other than the dragons. And an elemental being's age is longer than anything in this world, as mentioned by Zhang Li himself to his friend Ajdaha. If one such a pep calls out time in Tevat as a mere fraction of the length that dragons have existed, then how long ago were they alive? How long did they exist before the primordial one came to Tevat, and who was a pep speaking to? Nahida and Ruka Devata? If not, then do dragons live longer than the Traveler, which is an outlander? Longer than Paimon, even. If Paimon is the god of time that everybody speculates, then the dragons and every other elemental being who still lives could very well predate them too, since we don't know where the primordial one came from and how old it is when it got here. Next up, Artifacts. Borukasha's Glow is likely an artifact set that will have lore about the Erminsoul, or a special tree somewhere in Sumeru. The term Borukasha is the name of the Heavenly Sea or Cosmic Ocean in Persian, Indian, Egyptian, and Zoroastrian mythology. Zoroastrianism's Borukasha also has something called a tree of all seeds, right in the middle of the Heavenly Sea. This tree of all seeds is called the Harvest Token, I'm sorry for butchering that, also known as the Gaukarana, which is the Ermin Soul tree in Aranara. In my head, there is another big Ermin Soul somewhere in the next patch. Or maybe it's a tree that the Tori burned in this cinematic here hasn't happened, which we still don't have any info about. There's also mention of a bird that shakes the bow of the Harvest Token and sprinkle it around when the tree lights up, which could be a link to the bowkeeper Dainsleaf possibly carrying a branch of Ermin Soul and maybe probably planting it all over to that. Now since Erminsoul is closely tied with the Dendro Archon and her consciousness, we'll probably get some lore about Ruka Devata before she erased herself as well. Not to mention an eerie reference to the imaginary tree and the sea of Quanta from Honkai. Lastly, the Vorukasha is also related to the creator deity known as Ahura Mazda. In Genshin, we know him as Ormazd, the King of Kings. Some pieces, or the artifact set entirely, may have lore that focuses on what might have happened with Lilupar as well as Ormazd and his family. Next up is Nymph's Dream, which I can only think of as the dream that the Goddess of Flowers had while King Deshwet was busy creating the Eternal Oasis, or that it could be lore about her dream in the Eternal Oasis itself. Most likely, the time she spent with the Dendro Archon and King Deshwet, and I wouldn't be surprised to know more lore about the Jin and Seelie and even the Pari, as well as what might have happened 
happened before the fall of the Sealy Kingdom. Finally, the tournament arc which has playable characters on each Dorshin except for Vahumana. Al Haytham will likely be an announcer of the tournament itself, hearing his voice talking about Kaveh, as well as still possibly being the acting Grand Sage. Tenari, I think, is who's facing off with Kaveh since we've seen one character going off against each other. Now, listen, I think the character representing Vahumana is going to be Scaramouche, or Wanderer. Scaramouche's entire life is to find the cause for him being in Tavat, discarded by A, leaving Tatarasuna, and now not becoming a god and losing his heart for the nth time. So it's still his journey to find his heart, or dare I say, his purpose. Which fits with Vahomana studies as well as Vahomona, the concept of accomplishing duties and state of mind. It could also be Baizo, since he studies disease and etiology comes in tow with medicine too, finding the source of a certain strain as well as Baizo pursuit of immortality. Whew. Okay, that's everything spinning in my head regarding the new 3.6 patch. So, is Kavi supposed to be a 5 star or is he actually just a 4 star? I don't want to use up any more time because this video is already a bit too long for my taste. So I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? Like, comment if you enjoyed, subscribe for more random links, and stay mad theorists. Bye!